Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us again today. My name is Charles Rice. I'm the host of today's webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about virtual prototype assembly. Your presenter today is Pete Sheldebrand. If you don't know Pete, he's an application engineer for the Siemens Simpson or Test Lab products. All right. Well, thanks, Charles. Today, we're going to talk about some virtual stuff. So even though uh, Charles and I work in the testing group of Siemens, there are some tools that are in the SimCenter test lab toolbox that help you doing some virtual predictions of noise and vibration. And to kind of, I don't know, set the tone a little bit as to what we're trying to do with this virtual prediction. Charles, if you had to guess, what limits the driving range of an electric vehicle? I feel like it should be the battery, but I don't know if it was a trick question. <laughs> Oh, for sure. It's a trick. So battery. <laughs> yeah, maybe. weight for sure. Yeah. yeah. What do the measurement systems that you and I work with or that Siemens makes do? What does it measure? Sound pressure, vibration, uh, strength. Yeah, sound and vibration. So yeah. what if I told you it was actually noise that limits the range of an electric vehicle? Would you believe me? Okay. I'm interested. <laughs> yeah. How's that possible? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you think about it, like an electric car, a lot of them, you know, they have that big battery, you know, and yeah. people work to optimize how much uh, energy is used by the vehicle and the size of the battery. But then t there's an electric motor that drives the wheels. And that's like the electric motor is kind of like in the trunk area. And to drive the wheels, it actually has gears, like a gearbox to yeah. go from the motor to the wheels or to the axle of the wheels. Right. And what do gears, when they're meshing, do they make any noise? Uh, they, as you say, they can make some wine, gear wine, even rabbit. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. So, um, you know, the CEOs of these fancy electric car companies, they get driven around. They sit in the back seat. They're right above this thing. <laughs> and they hear that wine, and that's very irritating to them. But, yeah. you know, really, you know, the wine could be irritating to anyone. So... As a result, like at some of these car companies, they wanted to reduce that wine. They did it by increasing the viscosity of the fluid that contains these gears in the gearbox. It's the amount of sound that the thing generates. But if you have more drag, higher viscosity fluid, uh, okay. uh, that creates drag on the vehicle. You go from something like 200 miles of range down to 180. Right. What's disturbing about that is when it comes to noise, people have trouble predicting how much noise something will make early on when they just have the components. It's not until you get kind of the whole vehicle together that you notice this noise. Is that kind of? Yeah, would you that's, my that? experience. <laughs> that's my experience. That's my experience. Yeah, it's usually a system problem, right, for noise. Yeah. Hard to know what will be irritating and reach the driver's ear and what won't. And so the, the thing that we're going to talk about today is this virtual point assembly tool. And we'll talk about how that manifests itself with noise. And, and there's a very similar tool in Test Lab today that some people might be familiar with called transfer path analysis. Have you heard of that thing, Charles? I have heard of it. And that you have like a source system that vibrates, right? Like your yeah. electric motor, or it imparts force into your structure. Yeah. And the structure from where the motor is attached, it in turn generates noise at the operator ear. So you might hear something or you might feel vibration. In this transfer path model, how do we characterize the forces that are coming out of this thing? Well, the force, if you can measure it directly, that'd be yeah. good. Can't yeah, and sometimes it. we measure it indirectly with acceleration. But basically, it's a function versus frequency. I'm drawing terribly here, but I still feel compelled to do it, right? So we got like a force, maybe a Newton's or something like that. And then the structure, like going from wherever this thing's attached to the operator ear, there we might use an FRF, right? Yeah. So we would characterize the FRF with something that sound pressure divided by force, and it too, boy, supposed to be a straight line. <laughs> it would have peaks or whatever, right? A function right. versus frequency. And if we had four mount locations, you know, one, two, three, four, we would need four forces as a function of frequency. Mm -hmm. We would need four these FRFs that go from the various attachments. So uh, we can do a lot to characterize these things. 
by using FRFs and forces. And being test people like we are, we're used to going out and maybe testing and getting those FRFs. But it's also possible to get them from simulation, right, Charles? Yeah, those guys are useful too. Yeah, so transfer path will we'll do either one. And just a reminder, I guess, so, you know, in test lab under tools add-ins, you can turn on transfer path analysis. I started transfer path, so there's no add-in here, but it would say transfer path analysis. And the module looks something like this. You set up a model with all the paths that you are interested in representing between the source item and the operator ear or whatever the ultimate target is. You can have multiple of them. In this case, there's 15 paths, so there'd be 15 FRFs, 15 forces, three directions on each of these, so that's five paths total. And you'd, you'd gather the FRFs, which again could be from simulation or test. You combine them together and you can look at some results here. Let's take a look here at the RPM along the bottom, Charles, and amplitude for is color coded. So the hotter the color, the higher the amplitude of the noise or vibration. And then we have the actual paths over here. So which path would you say is responsible for the total? It looks like uh, body one Z looks pretty guilty in that particular frequency uh, RPM range. Yeah, wherever body one Z is, somebody put there right so it's always body one z in our example <laughs> is it? Um, and uh, you can look at things like here's body one x for example so the transfer path software will bring up this is the force we multiply that times the frf so we got force here force in the denominator that gives us pressure right the pressure through this path is so the transfer path software is just multiplying some functions frequency based functions together comes up with the total for that path here, but it also has a sum of all the paths, and you can see it's close to the measured total. If we look at body 1Z, we can see, oh, body 1Z, then we got an FRF, that's causing the problem, et cetera. Okay, so those, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. But you'll notice, if you look at this software, there's a lot of names here, right, for the data. Yeah. There's a lot of to manage, right? Yeah. With the VPA assembly tool, we're trying to make things easier and address some of the challenges of doing this. And also when I did this, I did it for just one source here. So let me kind of explain a little bit. Every product, you know, we're using cars as an example. So a lot of industries are being affected by electrification. So the mechanisms for which noise or vibration problems occur isn't always well known. There's a lot of different uh, variants off of the same product and a lot of things going on to make things challenging. So we think this tool, you know, we want to be able to predict as much as possible proactively that noise and vibration performance. And you got potentially lots of different source systems. So like steering wheels could create noise. Did you know that, Charles? Yeah, the motors. Everything. Yeah, the, they're they're all like electric motor driven these days. So again, electrified. And like if you're in a parking lot and there's hardly any noise and you turn the steering wheel, you'll hear noise. And sometimes it can be pretty bad. It sounds like a zipper opening and closing type thing if it's not designed well. You got HVAC noises, for example, in a car, drive lines, compressor noise. There's still an AC compressor, for example, in an electrified car. But again, every product, you got hydraulic pumps on construction equipment, you got compressors running in appliances, they all have this thing. And we all wanna understand the noise and vibration as much as possible up front. So you ever seen this uh, V, Charles? Yes. What is it? Because I have no idea. <laughs> so describing the amount of effort of the, or the design cycle, I should say. Yeah, you start, with all concept over here, right? Yeah. So I guess you're purely virtual. And then uh, by the time you get over here, you actually have a physical prototype. Yeah. And this is the whole virtual product that you're making, could be a car like that. But as you go down the V here, you're gonna start engineering virtually all the systems and subsystems that go into this. Mm -hmm. And then eventually add real stuff. So you start out, pretty virtual, 
but eventually you start adding in real world stuff as you develop things and end up all physical. But we'd like to discover noise and vibration issues way over here rather than discovering them over here. Because if you discover them over here, you got to go back to the beginning, right? Yeah. Also on the right, they're really expensive <laughs> to discover. Very expensive to change a car once it's in production and pay for the tooling and everything else. So if we're going to do virtual prediction, we need to be able to work with simulation data, for example. Were you aware, Charles, if you're a test lab user, if, that you can use simulation data in test lab? Yeah. Not everyone is, because you know it's called test lab, so you'd think that doesn't have anything to do with simulation or computer models, right? Come in here under other file formats, and Nastran, for example, is a simulation code. I can grab, this is a Nastran output to file. You know, there's a full geometry and everything. But if I grab this data, this is a FRF function, like I was describing before with my terrible drawings, but that's a simulation FRF. And I can take this data directly out of simulation file and use it in test lab to create components or do transfer path analysis. So that that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that's handy. Yeah, that will let us get very forward in that V. Notice it has units here, G's per Newton. And that's because test lab simulation folks, when they make a computer model of a component or whatever it is, and you generate an FRF, it's actually unitless. Did you know that? I think I've heard this, yeah. But test lab, we got a little configuration file where you can say, they, they'll try and use a consistent unit system. You can denote what it is in the fine element data so the data comes in with real units. because. I might multiply this by real forces measured in Newtons, but if I don't have the right Gs per Newton on my simulation data, I won't be able to predict the vibration, for example. So one very important component is to get simulation data to start out on the, the V. Let's go here. So we want to be able to mix and match, maybe use real test data, use simulation data, whatever is the best available data to do our predictions up front. And if you're in a big company, there might be people working on different components or suppliers across the world and then, or other physical locations. Another thing that if you're going to do this noise and vibration prediction, might be good to have like a database of simulation models. And when I say a database, you see like a simulation model here of a full vehicle. But what we're really going to store in here is this FRF that we calculate off of the full vehicle. So people can create things like a set of FRFs that represent vehicle body. And then we might have sources like an AC compressor, and we'd have the forces versus frequency that we put in this database. Does that sound like a good idea to have? You know, if you're an AC manufacturer, you might have five or six different AC compressors. You should be able to store them all in a database and just call on them when you want to put them in different vehicles. That would be efficient. You'd be surprised, Charles, you know, as I go around. There's a lot of individual engineers who have this data sometimes, but <laughs> it's kind of weird that you see people actually like organized and like feeding a central database so that people can grab from the database these components to do the prediction. Job security. So we do support this. You could either just grab files or you can actually grab data out of a central database if you want, uh, either either way. One way being chaos, one being ultra work. <laughs> Seems necessary to, to have both potential. This uh, software I'm showing here is something called Virtual Prototype Definition. And we're grabbing some data. So these, in this case, it's, FRFs, I believe, so it's a component, giving it a name, I can add attributes there, and then I can do a publish to publish the, the data. So let me maybe actually show that, uh, not in a movie, but, but for real. So first off, Charles, to get to this wonderful tool I'm describing, the virtual prototyping tool, mm -hmm. uh, you go to tools here in test lab, if you're in the latest versions, in the world of add-ins, they're all cool, right? And there's a lot of them. 
the best add-ins nowadays with the latest versions are way towards the bottom. They all began with the letter V. Did you know, you got <laughs> virtual prototype transformation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the virtual prototype assembler, virtual prototype definition. That's where all the action is. And um, these are all available via token, so you can run them if you have the token licensing. I'm gonna just put on two of them right now. So we got this virtual prototype definition. And if I go, let me see here. Let's say I had some some data here, something like like this. And I go to the definition here. I could have some input locations, you know, some output locations. EDU is electric drive unit, so these would be potentially some mounts or whatever it is. I have a collection of FRFs, and when I like the FRFs, which are going to have some inputs and outputs, and they can have multiple inputs and outputs, I would hit publish and publish it. So transfer path software and the virtual prototype definition software, they don't take data, but any data that you have that you've either measured, FRF data or loads, from both simulation or test, uh -huh. you can bring them in here and create components. And then when you go to this assembler here, let me uh, just maybe start a little bit more from uh, scratch here. Move components, let's say. I can go in here and I can say, I want to grab one of the components I published and use it. So for example, in this case, I might have something like some airborne airborne data, right? Okay. And then I grab something like a, uh, a load. So see, I have a library of different components. Like in this case, it looks like it's car bodies. And so I got different car bodies I'm thinking of evaluating. And then I could grab airborne loads and put them here, right? Mm -hmm. I can grab these and say, I want to uh, connect them. And I made a connection between my airborne loads and then the airborne response of my vehicle body. That looked pretty easy, uh, like I could even try it. <laughs> yeah, and it was very easy. What's interesting about this is it, it's hard, you almost forget once you've made these components, is that there's actually several functions here. There's five connections between the airborne loads and the airborne response, the vehicle body in this case. Under this electric drive unit on the back, the bottom, the front, the left, right, there's airborne loads being created and then these responses on the, on the vehicle body to predict sound at the driver's ear. And by the way, I should note, See, we have vehicle body here, but you you don't have to use just vehicle bodies. We got you covered no matter what you make. C, hold on, program files, thank you. Sim Center. It's just a few clicks in, but you know, it could be an aircraft, again, could be a motorcycle, satellite, gotcha. washing machine. Use whatever icon you want here. You know, the that's tractor a, sounds interesting. Yeah, you know, I guess we could use more than one version of a tractor. That that looks like an agricultural tractor, but maybe we need a, a lawnmower too. Anyway, so there it was easy to make the connections, and then there's this thing called the test scenario. This you could actually use to do things like, let's say you had uh, data that went from. 1,000 to 6,000 RPM, but you only needed the analysis up to 3,000 RPM. The test scenario would say, let's just look at it, up to 3,000 RPM. Test scenario also says things like use RPM as the basis for viewing stuff, or if it's like pass by noise, use position. So really there's three types of things that we can have as blocks there. There's components, which are passive components that have are represented by FRFs. There's the loads from sources. And then there's this test scenario that kind of tells us how we want to view or look at the data in the end. 
Is that making sense so far, Charles? Yeah. And then you can uh, process this, and then you, you go back to Navigator. The data will already be, be here. Here I can see stuff like the contributions to different ears, for example, and compare them. I could look at the resulting overall. And uh, again, if you have different components, when you're doing this assembler, if I have a different body, I can come here and I can say, hey, replace this. And I want to use something like this, well, no trim airborne. I guess no trim. What do you think, Charles? Should that be assembly three here, I think? That's assembly three. No trim. Run it. And then back here, look at my no trim overall level. Oh, oh. yeah. I, I think out. that might be a little louder if I don't use. Uh, you take out the seats, the carpets, the headliners, it tends to go up. And <laughs> yeah, you know, again, you might have some manager or someone in the organization. Hey, do we really need all that expensive acoustic material? Blah, blah, blah. Well, you aggressive <laughs> for cost savings, but maybe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we could instantly show them why they might need that by using a tool like this. The idea is to be able to do some pretty quick iterations if you have this nice component library, which again could just be files on a network drive, or you could have what we call centralized database that the stuff gets stored in that maybe requires certain meta information describing the, the components. So making sense so far, Charles? Yeah. What's interesting about this too is suppliers are more than willing to give you some of this data because they're not going to have to give you the full finite element model you know, of their component. They'll just give you the FRFs, for example, at the interface locations. It makes it nice for sharing data and then being able to still do the prediction. You can use it for contribution analysis. We can actually do some listening with these types of things. A lot of uh, different things. That that we can potentially do. But here's an interesting challenge. I'd mentioned that all the cool add-ins are under V. You know, we might have something like this where we got a simulation model. And simulation people can do some interesting things. They can they can do rotational degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. but measuring vibration with an accelerometer. Are you often measuring rotational acceleration, Charles? No, not me. No. Yeah. And then there's things like if they have a tire like that in their model, they can apply a load like right in the center. But us test guys, we can't really measure in the center of a tire like that, can we? We can't measure there, but that doesn't mean we can't derive the FRS for that point. Oh, yeah? So yeah. what you're telling me is you can figure out this FRF based on measurements taken around here. Yeah, that is yeah. possible. Let me show and let me uh, just kind of, under tools, add-ins, I showed virtual prototype assembly definition, virtual prototype assembler. Now you're going to show us this third V, Charles? Yep, the other cool V. <laughs> the other cool V. All right, a trifecta of cool Vs today. So I'll let you take it away. All right, let me switch, show my screen. Just to kind of orient everyone really quickly with this example. Um, we're going to be using this tire model example. And as Pete said, what we want to do, he's already alluded to it, is get the FRS at this point in our wheel assembly, right here in the center. We can't easily instrument that, but what we can do is measure very close to that point. We can take FRF measurements and apply forces around this virtual point where we would like to have not only just the translational FRFs, but also the rotational ones, especially in this specific example. And once we have that information, we can even, as part of this example, look at other locations, how the forces here at the center of this wheel assembly, what will be the load to other locations, I guess, on the passive side. So example, this knuckle. Uh, so just to kind of orient you with the setup really quickly, you can see we're using Triax accelerometer, right? And as well, these 
turquoise arrows kind of represent where we are uh, exciting and we're using that integral shaker and you can see when we get into it it's uh this method requires a little bit of extra testing effort we're going to have in this particular scenario is 180 frfs when we take in the account our four responses and all the references as well as the responses at the knuckle location which isn't picture here so let's just hop into test lab i've already turned on the virtual point transformation add-in first thing to do we're going to take these frfs i said we had a quite a few. We're going to put those in our input basket. So I'll select the first one, Let's hold down shift, and I'll say replace the input basket. Now this is our tire model, and you can see I left on a lot of the nodes that we're not even using just to show you a, a point uh, quickly in the virtual point transformation about how the software works. So if we just use component visualization, some of these we're not even using, so we don't need them on just for visualization purposes. I'll turn them off. So some related to the force of the tire patch and the tire itself also. Now, hopefully it's a little easier to look at. And just to kind of orient everyone, the response and excitation location that we are working with are right here, this degree of freedom, one, rim two, REM3 and REM4. And what we want to do is derive at this location where we can't easily instrument or measure at the center of our wheel assembly, what are the FRS there? Translational and the rotational, as well as the FRS from this center uh, location of our wheel to a plumb place on the knuckle. Now, if we go into the virtual point transformation, you'll see all of these points are here, right? What I put into the input basket were just FRFs related to four points as well as the knuckle, but I also have stuff related to the tire. And these are all because it reads the entire geometry model. So that's why you'll see them in the list, even though they weren't part of the FRFs that I import. So the first step is to identify in the geometry for the software, uh, where what, what is our virtual point? that we want to derive our FRFs for. So we're calling it a rim center. So we'll just add, hit add there after we select it. And now we have to define uh, the reference indicators where we're exciting. And that we said that's at points one, two, three, and four. So we'll add those. And immediately you see we get some information about our condition for this matrix. And we'll talk about that in a second. And also we need to define what are the response indicators. They're at the same locations, so they have the same name. And you can see here one thing, by default, all of our X, Y, and Z are turned on. And these condition numbers down here refer to the inversion process that's happening for this geometric matrices that we're using to do this virtual point transformation. And TestLab builds this Matrices extracting information from the position of these different degrees of freedom in the geometry. So for this reason, it's critical that we have a very accurate geometry, right? It doesn't need to be detailed, but it needs to be accurate in the sense the distances and locations need to be accurate. You don't need a lot of information that you're not using, but the information that we have needs to, to be accurate. And another thing you'll notice, the reference count and the response count. Because we're deriving a six by six, basically, matrices for this virtual point at this center, it has a dimension of six. We need to have a minimum of six indicators for our reference and our response locations. And the software will even tell you that if I turn these off, you'll start to see it goes orange. And then eventually, if I turn off more than six, it says it's red. So when it comes time to basically develop this virtual point transformation, you know you need at least six references, but if you have more, that'll be better because that'll actually drive this condition a number to be lower. And if you use transfer path analysis, you might be familiar with this, but we typically wanna keep this number below 100. And the more indicators we have, we basically overdetermine that matrices and that helps with the calculation, giving us better results. Now, one thing you can do, which is nice, why don't I just clear this for a second? Even before 
you take any measurement data, which you could do is just go to sensor and reference check. And I can do the same thing. I can say, okay, on my geometry, once we've created geometry, we can come into virtual point transformation and say, okay, I'm gonna add a virtual point. I know that I have indicators at these four locations for my responses, as well as my references. And as I click this, turn these on, you'll see that I'm able to determine, uh, for example, we're just looking at the reference. I have six and that's not that great. And my condition number is crazy high. So what it can allow you to do is, and if I just add one more here in the Y direction at this location, I get a pretty decent reference condition a number. And I can see maybe I could get away with just seven references. So it allows you, even before you take an FRF, right? Because there's a lot of effort involved. As we saw in this case, we had like 180 FRFs. It allows you to come in and just using your geometry, determine, well, how many references do I really need? And not only the number of references, but their geometric location plays into this reference condition number. So it's a good way to upfront kind of help you with determining your test setup. So let's clear this and go back to virtual point transformation. Just so that you know that capability is there up front. And so another thing we had was at the knuckle position, right? We wanted to be able to derive the FRS from this virtual point to this point on our knuckle. And so what we'll do is you go to the other tab and it'll use the reference as automatically as the virtual point that we're deriving. So all I need to do is select for it the knuckle response location. So we'll put that in. And if we go back to our virtual points, now we're ready to go to our next tab, FRF selection. We can hit refresh, brings in all the FRFs that we put into our input basket. And you can just click on these. If, if you use transfer path analysis, you can probably used to it, you can actually even drag, highlight multiple to kind of get an idea of your FRF quality. And with everything related to transfer path analysis and this component TPS is virtual point transformation, we really want to start with high quality FRF. So it gives you an opportunity to look at them before you use them in this uh, calculation. So now that we're set up, we can hit the calculate button using the transformation tab. You can see at the bottom, kind of gives you indication what's going on, still calculating, it's busy. Now we're done. So right off the bat, we get a heat map and you can see it's broken down into two regions. So these are our derived FRF for that center virtual point, right? We use the four points around it to derive FRFs for that center location of our wheel assembly. And this is three by six right here are the data in our heat map from the FRS from the knuckle. And you can even move this around. If we go to test results, you can check reciprocity at different locations. Now you can immediately save the results, but better than that, what we wanna do is do some quality checks, right? How good is this calculation? So one thing we wanna check is the rigidity. Some of the requirements, one of them being the biggest, probably we have to make an assumption that it's rigid. We're assuming a rigid solid dynamic behavior at those four locations around the virtual point that we're measuring. And what this index allows us to do, this rigidity check, and you can check it for the reference as well as the responses, is to determine basically over what frequency range where we can consider the structure to be adhering to this requirement, right? It's locally rigid. You can see here, it's an index that goes from zero to one, but really what it's doing, how this rigidity curve is calculated is similar to maybe modal synthesis a little bit if you used our modal analysis packages, but for every reference degree of freedom in our virtual point transformation, we have measured FRF between a reference and a response. We have this data that we measure, but what we can do now that we have these virtual point FRFs that we derive, we can recalculate an FRF between that same reference and same response location using the assumption that rigidity is a requirement being held to around that virtual point, as well as these FRFs. 
So basically, it's just a comparison between the measure FRF and the recalculated FRF using our virtual point FRFs to do it. And we want to be around 9.9, 0.8. So you can kind of see pretty quickly after maybe 170 hertz, because this check is done at every frequency line, that it's falling off pretty quickly. And same thing with the, the reference and the response. So what we'd want to do is then go over to our heat map and maybe move this over to uh, that range of about a zero to 170 hertz or so. That looks more uh, appropriate because our index pretty much falls apart. Uh, if you go higher in frequency, you have more elastic behavior. So that rigidity assumption isn't going to hold. Another check we can do, looking at the derived FRFs, we can do a driving point check. So for example, one thing we know about driving point FRFs, what would we expect? Well, between each uh, residence, uh, anti-residence, so we see that, you know, a driving point, we're measuring and exciting at the same location, so we would expect consistent phase. We see that, so that makes us feel good uh, about our calculation. And additionally, you could come over here and do a FRAC or frequency response insurance criteria or a phase assurance criteria check as well. But now that we feel good about the results, we can say uh, save results, we give it a name. We'll just call this uh, temp2. And you can even save these rigidity results that we have for future reference check to share with people. We go back to the navigator, it saves by default all of my uh, virtual point transformation results under this section, virtual point transformation result. And we did temp two, if we go here, you can see our results. So these are our FRFs from the center, derived center point to that knuckle, as well as all of the six degrees of freedom, the FRS at that center location. Uh, so now that we have those FRS, we yes, could go APA. back to a uh, virtual prototype assembly and utilize that. Okay, oh. I think uh, that's all I was going to show with regard to uh, our virtual prototype assembly, Pete. Quick uh, question. So the reason why we need six of those things is because we're going to get at least three translations and three rotations as a result of the virtual point transformation, right? Yeah. So so we take six translational measurements and then get three translations three rotations is that kind of yeah. what's going yeah. on there yeah. yeah that's pretty cool I, I think it's cool because yeah when you're connecting up potentially simulation data to test data yeah you need you may not be able to measure exactly where the simulation data input is you know for this for one of these components and then again, simulation data might have rotational FRFs, for example, but your test data might not. So it's good that you can can do that. You know, and then I guess you can use matrix inversion or whatever to get the forces that are coming in at that spot that you couldn't possibly put a transducer at in the center of that tire. Right. Among the three Vs, virtual prototype uh, assembly, virtual prototype definition, and virtual point transformation. I think you had the coolest V, Charles. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll let the audience decide. <laughs> yeah, well, that's my opinion. So uh, yeah, and again, I showed a very simple example in the software, but you can have multiple components, you know, all sorts of structure-borne, airborne, uh, different types of things here. Principal components for road noise that are separated. Nonlinear mounts where you would have like a set of mount curves that change as a function of the displacement into the mount, for example. And again, the whole goal here was using these FRFs and the uh, forces as a function of frequency. We can combine them with this virtual prototype assembly and do some quick what if calculations like we did with the, the trim stuff. And, you know, some people ask questions like, does it take a long time to calculate if you have lots of FRFs? Here's an example where 60,000 FRFs were used behind the scenes. And the answer is it's still just minutes of calculation time. 
right? Because all the calculations, like if you're calculating the FRF that you're going to use in virtual prototype assembly, that might take a while because uh, you have to run your full fine element model to generate those. Another little feature here is this thing called sound synthesis. This basically, the virtual prototype assembler is a frequency-based tool only, predicts levels of sound as a function of frequency, but the, the sound synthesis add-on can take things like the virtual prototype assembly, put it in the sound synthesis module, and then generate sounds on the fly, kind of let you drive a, a product virtually, you know, through different speeds and things, and it, you would be able to listen to it. So I guess you know another way of saying is that you would be able to oralize these models that you've created with the virtual prototype assembly in a tool like this. Conclusions, virtual prototype assembly lets you do some upfront predictive calculations of the sound based on simulation data, but you can refine it further as you go through the product development V with actual test data. Let's you do a lot of things like listen to it, create a database of components, do quick swaps and things like that. And that concludes our presentation.